but what was relevant is how do you live in the context of an empire or in the shadow of an empire where you see oppression and you see segregation and you see domination and where where the powers that be have their their boot on the throat of the disinherited and the disenfranchised and the poor and that he was one of them and so um, just then to shift then I think if we're going to find uh, the mandate of Jesus for his kingdom aha we're back to politics and he does have a kingdom after all but it's a very subversive kind of kingdom isn't it it's a kingdom he says is within us it's a kingdom that he says is nonviolent. it is a kingdom um, that engages the enemy other in ways that his zealot friends um, and disciples would have would have thought were too mild but also it's it's far more engaging and prophetic than those who would want to privatize their faith and now this comes back to us um, when we talk when we talk about uh, Christian faith I do see two ditches one is one is a politicized ditch where we conflate our idea of politics with, let's say, party politics and partisan policies, we begin to conflate that with our Christianity and we start preaching that from the pulpit and telling people who to vote for or sending out like a urgent intercession requests to make sure we vote and vote our guy in so that our Christian policies can be enforced through political power. And that, to me, that that is a... That is not what the Sermon on the Mount is prescribing. The other ditch, though, is when we, when we decide we're going to make our faith uh, purely private, you know. And this is a very this is the the first ditch we might see is a very American problem. Um, the Canadian problem is keep your faith in your bedroom, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> keep it, or or in the privacy of your closet and. Um, and yet, uh, this kind of split between public public faith and private faith would also have made no sense to Jesus Christ. So when he talks about, um, blessed are you who are hungry and thirsty after righteousness, the word he's using there is identical for, uh, to the word we use for justice. Mm -hmm. So justice, public justice, and personal righteousness were, were not separate living as those who love God and neighbor and stranger and enemy have a public faith, mm. public, but not politicized, um, but political in the sense that it engages and addresses the powers where we see injustice because Jesus wasn't just about making good Christians. He wants to actually restore humanity and redeem society but it's so important right because we we can end up just being uh becoming servants of a political party mm -hmm. where they give us our script and mm -hmm. where um when you depart from that script then you're seen to you know in some kind of act of betrayal or something like that mm -hmm. uh, rather i think the idea is to consistently ask what is the gospel calling us to do? What is Jesus calling us to do? What is love compelling us to do? And that is hazardous because sometimes what love is calling us to do is the opposite of what the state is promoting. And sometimes it coincides with what the state is promoting. But we have to remember it's a coincidence. <laughs> so that we don't buy into the ideology that drives them just because the outworking of it in this moment happens to coincide. So for example, um, let's take uh, an immigration policy. Well, I take my immigration policy from Jesus uh, call to welcome the stranger. So then, so then I might, I might want uh, our politicians to know that their policies are just or unjust in 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 how they're engaging with with um, like with immigration issues. That said, uh, when we talk about what we should do, 
it's very important to remember who we are. Mm -hmm. In other words, what is the public, what is the public faith for our church look like when it comes to immigration? And so as it relates to Lakeview Church, then it's like, well, what is your position on immigration? I don't want to hear a partisan public document. I want to hear how you are going to engage strangers in your community. It takes a lot of focus and discipline to continually say, I'm, I am not of that world. And the reason I'm not of that world is the othering. It is the sense of us and them that requires an enemy is energized by conflict with that enemy and, and is, is always about win lose rather than win win. And, and with, with, when we start labeling something far, far left or far right, then we, we also think, oh, and we need to silence that enemy as well. We need to beat them and we need to silence them and so on. So then, I'm like, okay, so I don't believe in that. I believe um, that Jesus called us off the spectrum, but not out of engagement. And so he gives us some pattern of engagement and called love. So one of my personal practices is that, um, is that I don't want to live in a, in an echo chamber of people who agree with me. Mm -hmm. So let's say on uh, one example of that would be, um, uh, I am, I am very, I, I believe that Christ's Sermon on the Mount is very clearly uh, a condemnation of, of militarism as a solution to anything. You don't cast out Satan using Satan. <laughs> that said, then, Wherever I get a strong conviction, and again, I'm not hardly looking for this. I get a strong conviction about that. And what does the Lord do? He brings me a lieutenant colonel of the U.S. Special Forces. And now I can either turn from him or engage him. And we became very good friends. We're in contact probably three times a week. And, 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 and I could not make his leaving the military a condition of that but what it did and and he knew exactly where i stand and he made the same choice and so so one was to enter relationships with with those who differ with you strongly about something um with an understanding that maturity is being able to hold difference with respect maturity is holding difference with respect so then we in our classrooms at St. Stephen's University, um, you know, I had a conservative Republican student from California who's a pastor sitting in my class next to um, a lesbian who, which this was like, what is she doing here? It's like, she loves Jesus. Oh, and I mean, literally, they sat next to each other every day and became tense friends. But it was like they had the maturity to hold difference. And she never accused him of homophobia. And he never called her an abomination. Mm -hmm. And they didn't change their minds. Yeah. But maturity allowed them to hold difference with respect. Remembering we are children of God. Mm -hmm. So to call someone brother or sister then... Um, is is an assault on every other status that would would undermine the kingdom. What I need, and and you've offered, um, and I think this is the big solution, the big big solution in in a culture where we have all sorts of politicized issues and divisions, is 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 empathy, mm -hmm. and. Um, I mean that in a very heavy way, in the sense of empathy is the closest thing we come to the cross itself, where God puts himself in our shoes mm -hmm. and undergoes the fullness of our condition so that Hebrews 2 and Hebrews 4 says he, he now knows what we've experienced directly, not through omniscience, but through wounds yeah. that he bears. Yeah. And that's a God I can worship. And that's a God I can follow. Say your prayers. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so, 
specifically, you know, I, I do believe that if we, if we pray the Lord's prayer daily with attention, mm -hmm. you're always on, on a daily basis, you are going to run into father, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. He there recognizes I, what I love is that he's not pretending we don't have these tensions or even enemies. Yeah. Um, he, he's saying, if you can think of someone, if you can still think of someone as a, as a enemy where that is where there's animosity, then good. We can work with that. We'll pray that. And I pray the beatitudes every day, hmm. which I believe are the character of Jesus. So if you think about the things that generate us, them mentalities that become the foundations for injustice and exclusion. Mm -hmm. They can't get past the first three or four Beatitudes. It's mm -hmm. like, blessed for the poor in spirit, blessed are those who mourn with those who mourn, those who are meek, mm -hmm. who hunger for justice and who show mercy. 